Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Noon, and I am the chair of the Ontario Forage Focus. I'd like to welcome you to the um, to the Forage Focus 2021 for day two. This is the second of three webinars for this year's virtual conference. Because it is a webinar, although you can see and hear our presenters, we cannot see or hear you. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A feature and Christine O'Reilly will share them with the presenter at the end of the talk. Thank you to the Dairy Farmers of Ontario, Noon Forage, Steelhead Egg, ANL Canada, Ontario Sheep Farmers, Kemen, and AgriSolve Inc. for their generous partnership of this year's webinar series. Thank you to those sponsors. This, that all helps to put these events together. Everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording should you wish to watch the session again at a later time. The webinar will be posted on Ontario Forage Council's YouTube channel, so feel free to subscribe to be notified when the conference videos are posted. If you're on social media, please use hashtag Forage Focus. Today's webinar is brought to you by SGS Canada Inc. and Trillium Mutual Insurance Company. Today's session is called Understanding Your Feed Analysis. Our presenter, presenter is Anita Heeg. Anita graduated from the University of Guelph with an animal biology honors degree. Anita and her husband manage a dairy farm and have three young boys. She worked in the feed industry for seven years in the animal feed additive sector before joining Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs as the feed ingredient and byproduct specialist. In this role, Anita looks at the utilization of various feed ingredients. I'm happy to welcome Anita as our feature presenter. Okay, yes, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, as uh, I was introduced, you heard that I was going to speak on the understanding your forage analysis uh, for the uh, next uh, hour or so. Um, so the basic nutritional requirements of livestock um, may not have changed a whole lot over the last 25 years, uh, but I guess what has changed is our ability to determine uh, the nutritional content of feed stuff and feed ingredients and integrate the requirements with the nutrients supplied from that feed stuff. So um, with that, let's start looking at, um, you know, taking a feed sample. It's important to taking take a representative feed sample and it's often overlooked. Um, you know, just grabbing a quick sample is, is not the way to go when you want a representative sample. It is critical to getting accurate information uh, to inform not just yourself as a producer or a nutritionist, but also to input into your program if you're using one. And animals prefer uh, consistent feed. So depending on what species you're feeding, of course, the method of feeding can also influence the consistency. Um, and the feed analysis that you present, um, you know, represents the uh, analysis. So the feed sample is only as good, um, or the feed analysis is only as good as the sample that you have submitted. Um, misrepresentation of this, um, sampling or analysis can result in overfeeding or underfeeding, and both of these are costly. So taking a representative sample, of course, there's a lot of feed ingredients, and each um, are a little bit different in terms of how do you take a sample. So with regards to forages, uh, looking at baled forage, we recommend that you take a core sample of about 15 to 20 bales. You put them together um, in a clean bucket and uh, take a subsample from that, which you send off to the um, lab to be analyzed. Now, of course, bales have different sizes and shapes. So the small squares, we uh, prefer that you do it at a right angle near the center of the butt of the bale. Uh, the large square bales, the same thing, but not necessarily the center of the bale. Um, it's a large um, portion uh, that really you're getting a subsample from. The round bales, as shown in the right bottom corner, um, I've pictured it with an arrow. That's basically the angle that your probe is going into the bale and taking uh, the sample back out. The 
top right picture shows you a core. So basically there's a drill in there, you push it into the um, feed substance and then you take it back out with a probe. You push the uh, feed samples all together and then you take a um, representative sample from that. Uh, don't pull the samples out because the stem to leaf ratio is important in your analysis. So if you take that out by pulling it, all you will have is a stem and no leaf. And that's really where the protein is at. Taking a represent, representative sample of your silage, um, you want it to be as fresh as possible. So by coring into it, you will um, get to feeds that is not yet um, been exposed to either sunlight or snow or rain, uh, whatever, maybe wind is drying it out. Uh, and it's important to take about 10 to 20 samples if you can. Now, if you're using a core, um, sometimes using, um, you know, specific spots, so three at the top level, three at the middle level, and then three at the bottom level, for example, putting that together, preferably in a pail, not on the floor, so that you're contaminating your sample. Um, and then taking a subsample from that. Now, as you can see, a lot of it is exposed to air this way. So if you are not able to core it and you're actually grabbing samples, the probably the best way to do it is shortly after, um, you know, the feed has been taken so that you have a uh, fresh sample or, or take it from the uh, bucket or block cutter or whatever you're using to uh, take a representative sample. The only caution I would give you is that bunks are quite high nowadays. Um, so be careful that they don't collapse on you. And also when you're taking samples, try not to take them within a foot of the bottom or the top or the sides of it. Um, because for example, if it rained the day before, those areas can be quite um, wet. And so your moisture content and your dry matter is just going to be off compared to what your bunk actually is. Taking a representative sample from your pasture, uh, we suggest you select 10 to 20 sites uh, where the animals are grazing. Uh, so take a handful and clip it off at a grazing height. Now, of course, depending on the animal, um, there's a different grazing height. So sheep like to graze really low to the ground, whereas um, beef will likely go as low as three inches. So anywhere between three to 10 inches, um, you know, you can cut it from there, take it from different areas, put it together again, preferably in a clean bucket. If needed, you can cut them into smaller pieces so that you can mix it better and then take a subsample from there. Now the do's and don'ts of sample taking. Uh, so you do want to take a representative sample as mentioned, proper labeling the bag. Um, you know, you have to put what, what the sample is. You have to put your name on there, the date, um, you know, and sometimes even the time will be helpful for the lab. So um, therefore you also have to complete a submission form. Um, most of the laboratories have a submission form that's online. So you can go there, print it off and fill it in accordingly. And you want to remove any of the excess oxygen that's in, this, in the bag. Uh, sometimes a Ziploc bag is the easiest way for that, closing it about three quarters, quarters of the way, pushing the air out and then closing the rest. What you don't want to do is uh, sending a sample away on a Friday. It is very likely that your sample will not be analyzed over the weekend or if it even gets there because it might even get stuck in um, en route or stuck in a warehouse. So you do not want to do that um, because the fresher, oh, sorry, the fresher the sample is, the better. Um, you don't want to contaminate the sample, like I said, either with manure or dirt or anything else. Uh, pull samples from an intact bale and also submit a sample that is too large. Really watch your sample size um, because if you send a sample that's too large, and that is your subsample, the lab will only need to take another subsample of that, again, to get your analysis. Um, also, if it's overfilled, the, um, the bag can open. And so your feed analysis will be not, or will not be representative because it's um, either been exposed to air and dried out or, uh, for example. Um, so the lab submission forms, like I said, 
are online uh, and they are very similar layouts. They will uh, ask you for your uh, name, your address uh, to send the report back to, usually email address works as well, and then what kind of analysis you would like to do. Um, on the analysis, I suggest you do not cheap out. Uh, it is important to obtain as much information out of your feed sample as possible. Possible if you're sending it off anyways, you may as well do a good job of it. So there's two types of analysis that you can choose from in the um, on the uh, sample form that you fill out. You have wet chemistry analysis and near infrared analysis. So wet chemistry measures the nutrient content of a feed ingredient uh, with a high degree of uh, accuracy because it dries the ingredient and then it's followed by heat and chemicals to obtain nutritional information. And this method is often used with uh, samples that are not very common, so non-traditional feedstuffs. If you're looking at near-infrared uh, reflectance, it relates to a sample's reflectance of near-infrared light to the chemical composition of uh, the feedstuff. So unlike the wet chemistry, the NIR uh, relies on the prediction of equations on nutri nutrient levels. So for example, um, a forge like uh, Halich uh, will use the NIR. There's been enough analysis done that there is enough data to use an equation uh, given on the res results of the near infrared analysis. And so it's faster, uh, it's economical, um, but it's not available for all the uh, analysis. So it's not available for all the feedstuff. And it's definitely not suggested for new ingredients. In general, uh, you know, the nutritional attributes of feedstuff, um, most of us know that it has energy, so it provides the body with the ability to do work. Um, and then there's protein, main building block of the body. So that is required for muscles, for nervous system and connective tissue to name a few. And then of course the minerals required for growth and bone formation, reproduction and many other functions. So once you get your lab report back, uh, the basic anatomy is pretty much the same, uh, no matter what laboratory you've gone with. There is a column for the parameters, there's a column for as fed and dry, and then there's the units and the method at which they uh, obtained your numbers. So most producers have a fairly good uh, concept of the feed ingredients in terms of what their dry matter means, what protein means, and fiber. But once they get that report in their hands, uh, they're unsure of what this laboratory report is telling them. So um, that is my goal today to kind of help uh, those of you who are not sure of this to understand it and um, to know how to use it next time you have one. So laboratories, uh, like I said, generally have a different layout, but every, every lab report will have it on a dry matter basis um, because we make diets on a dry matter basis. So, um, and it is more uh, complete, if you will, than just a matter of thinking of a feed sample as having dry matter and protein. So, uh, for example, a lab report will help you understand the concept of protein. What is it made of and what is accessible to the animal or what is not available to the animal? So let's start off with crude protein, which is something that I think most people know. Uh, it is based on the nitrogen level of your feedstuff. So protein is made up of nitrogen and uh, it's 16% nitrogen. So in the lab, your total nitrogen is measured and then multiplied by 6.25, which is 10 over or 100 over 16 to report it on a crude protein basis. So generally, a uh, common analysis for haylage is anywhere between 18 to 24. Uh, your corn silages, for example, will come back at nine to, or seven to nine percent. But really, without looking into this, uh, you don't know what uh, it is made up of other than it is made up of the nitrogen, uh, including both the true protein that contains the amino acid and also um, the non-protein nitrogen. So for that, we need to look at it a little closer. 
So I took some Lego blocks from my kids to try and illustrate this. Um, on the left, you can see crude protein, and this is often how producers will talk about their samples. Uh, so my halogen you know, was 18 or 20 or 21% crude protein, and they know that that's a good amount. But really, how much of that is available to the animal? So on the right, my picture has it divided up uh, the same as a laboratory report would. So this one is uh, an example of the report I just showed you. So it shows you that the soluble crude protein is 66%. The undergradable intake protein is 23%. The neutral detergent fiber crude protein is 2%. And the acid detergent fiber is about 1%. So what does this really mean? Well, looking at the soluble crude protein, that is the part of the protein that is the most readily available to animals. So going back to this, you can see that it's the largest portion of your crude protein. Now, this is a good thing because it is available to the animals. So it consists of small amino acid change that are soluble in the rumen. And so it is absorbed across the rumen wall. And uh, it is the same whether you look at it on a asphed or a dry matter basis, because it is a percentage of your entire crude protein. So before discussing the next step, the ADF CP and the NDF CP, um, we have to understand what ANDF and NDF are. So for now, we'll skip that one and come back to it. So we will go to bypass protein. Now bypass protein uh, is a funny one. It has different names. It can also be uh, labeled as undegradable intake protein or rumen undegradable protein. So uh, even though it, go by, it goes by three names, it's really the same. It's basically the fraction of protein that is resistant to degradation by the rumen. So it is not absorbed by the rumen and it's, as the name says, undegradable and then bypassed. But because of this, it is valued uh, as it is absorbed in the small intestine. And uh, part of this is dependent on the structural aspect of the protein. Uh, sometimes it's the rumen pH that affects it. Um, and sometimes it's the feed processing that affects it. So to uh, move on, we'll go to fiber, which is labeled on the report as well. And my pictorial illustration of fiber, I guess, is that it can take on different appearances, yet we all know that they include fiber. So similarly, in the analysis of context of fiber, it is made up of various components, yet all included in that term of fiber. So fiber is a term that inc includes a number of parameters on the report as seen in the square green box, and it regulates the dry matter intake through rumen fill. Uh, NDF and ANDF are a big part of that, so it's really important to understand ADF and NDF. So um, when balancing a ration, the final fiber uh, and nutrient content really um, affect and influence the prediction of the intake based on animal factors. But understanding the ADF and the NDF, NDF have a big uh, part of that. So why is it that NDF and ADF influences the dry matter intake? Well, for that, we have to look at it at a cellular level. So this is a plant cell wall, and it is composed mainly of strong fibers. And each part of it is important in, important in understanding the dry matter intake, the rumen fill, and the digestibility. So I hope you can see this big enough, but, um, when you're looking at the structure of the cell wall, we talk about ADF. So ADF, as you can see by the red square box, uh, consists of the cellulose layer, which is the outside wall, and the lignin layer. Now, the easiest way um, to think of the lignin basically is like um, glue sticks. So that holds the outer and the inner together. However, the ADF is only composed of that outer cell wall and the lignin. Now, when we're looking at NDF, we're looking at the outer and the inner layer that's held by the lignin. 
And this becomes important when recognizing uh, the maturity of the plant. So looking at the lignin, it is an important part of the fiber. Um, lignin is, like I said, the glue sticks that hold the inner and the outer wall together. However, the lignin negative, negatively affects the digestion of the cell wall. It acts as a physical barrier to the uh, microbes. So it can't digest it very well, uh, the more lignin is there. So this number will increase, like I said, with maturity. And uh, for corn silage, for example, we're looking at usually two to 4%. And for a haylage sample, we're often looking at four to 12%. So you can see that on a dry matter basis, this sample falls uh, about mid-range for that at 7.39. Excuse me. <coughs> so like I said, the ADF, as that increases, uh, the digestibility decreases. Similarly, when you have NDF, your dry matter decreases. And I guess you think of it this way. Uh, this is my illustration with bird screen. Um, but on the left, there's a plant that is immature and you can see the cell walls. And as the plant matures, the cell wall thickness increases. So you know you're gonna have more ADF, more lignin, and more NDF. And um, so for the animal, if, for example, it was to eat the picture on the right over the picture on the left, you can imagine that it, it's more filling. Uh, it require more energy to chew, but also more effort for the rumen bugs to um, digest. So looking at the NDFD, so which is the NDF digestibility at 24 hours and 48 hours. Um, it is the hours that it was uh, looked at from the in vitro digestibility um, and determine how digestible your feed source is. In other words, how much of the feed material has been digested after either 24 hours or 48 hours by the rumen bugs. Um, so for the NDF D24, we are looking for numbers greater than 40. And for the NDF 48, we're looking at numbers uh, that are higher than 60%. Some samples come back with 70%, which is great. Um, but of course, it all uh, depends too on what animal you're feeding, um, you know, and if you want to slow that down or speed that up. Um, the important thing to note is that, uh, you know, there's a change over time and you want that change to um, show you that it's actually being digested. So now that you understand the ADF uh, and NDF, let's go back to the protein portion of it. So remember that the ADF crude protein and the NDF crude protein uh, on that Lego block uh, illustration was only a very small percent, so only one or two percent. However, it does have an effect on the, on the overall uh, crude protein. The ADF uh, crude protein is associated with a portion that is unavailable to the animal due to heating. Um, in forages, for example, you can see heating uh, like hot spots in the bunk. Um, and so it's affected the crude protein to a certain extent that it now is unavailable. In some of the byproducts, you see it, uh, for example, distiller grain in the actual heating process that's occurred during the grain processing. Um, the preferred number, um, really, if there's any, uh, would be between 0.8 and 1%. Uh, so that within this range, you know that minimal uh, damage has happened. Now, once it's elevated, uh, you, you uh, know that some overheating has occurred. occurred and it could affect the feed quality. Now the NDF CP is similar uh, to ANDF CP, but it has some digestibility associated with it. So the higher that number is, the more bypass protein it is. That protein is not digestible in the rumen. So it gets added to the bypass protein. Now some parts of your report 
will be based on calculations. So there's the NDF disappearance rate, basically like how fast did your NDF disappear or get used by the rumen bugs. And uh, then there is also total digestibility digestible nutrients. And this is basically your uh, energy. Um, and it's calculated because it's not a nutrient. Um, however, if you are uh, feeding a lactating animal, this could be the first limiting parameter uh, for milk production. So this equation um, was first um, was based on ADF until Dr. Bill Weiss uh, at the Ohio State University developed a new equation that encompassed more of the parameters. So for that reason, you'll see Weiss or uh, a nota notation of a W behind your equation. Um, now this new equation, including ADF, is also uh, now including the NDF, lignin, fat, starch, and energy values. So, uh, and in this equation, the NDFCP is used as a correction factor. Now, NDF um, is more frequently noted as ANDF. Um, so it will specify this. Um, and it indicates that an amylase has been used, which is an enzyme, to remove any of the starches that were still part of the NDF. Now, the next extension of that is ANDF FOM. And um, with that, it's ASH corrected. So it differs from NDF and ANDF in that it's now free of ASH, um, which indicates the value really on an organic matter uh, since ASH is inorganic. Uh, and to do this, they use an ashing furnace, they heat it up, uh, the ash is separated, and then removed and subtracted from the original NDF. Now, uh, there's quite a variability between NDF and the ANDF FOM sometimes, uh, depending on your ash contents. And you might wonder where this ash is coming from, but it's coming from soil. So 78% uh, has a little bit of contamination, 7-9% uh, seems to be contaminated, and then more than 11% could be problematic. Uh, now in Ontario, I have heard numbers of as high as 15%. So uh, basically, uh, you know, you're picking up soil during harvest. So maybe your rake settings are low enough to flick up the dirt. And so you get a big dust cloud behind you and that settles on your forages and then you're picking it up with harvest. Um, but other options or other ways, I guess, um, that it comes onto your forages is by low-lying lands that are often prone to flooding. Sometimes it's heavy rains that then splash up the dirt onto your forages. Um, or sometimes, um, you know, like I said, your equipment's just set just too low. And these ash levels could have an antagonistic effect um, to other minerals. So looking at minerals, um, you know, minerals are different for different plant species, right? Um, like I said, soil content could also affect the um, mineral content. However, uh, not necessarily just by picking them up while you're harvesting, but just the different content in the soil that the plant has picked up. Um, fertilization practices can also do the same or climate conditions. So the location of the minerals often uh, is the highest in the leaf. Um, and of course, species will make a difference. So grasses, for example, um, you know, have more digestible fiber than legumes. Um, so legumes are often uh, used in dairy rations like alfalfa. And, you know, it could also be a red or white clover uh, for pasturing. But legumes, too, 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 due to the fact that they have more leaves, tend to have more protein and energy and also micronutrients uh, than grasses. So uh, legumes have a higher level of uh, calcium, uh, magnesium, sulfur, and copper, whereas uh, legumes have less uh, manganese and zinc than grasses, but they're about equal when you're looking at them from a potassium or phosphorus level.
Now, sometimes minerals are, of course, also added to the diet to make any up for any deficiencies um, that may not have been, um, you know, may not have been added while adding your feed ingredients or forages. Relative forage quality is an, a calculation. Uh, this used to be relative feed value, and it was produced by hay producers um, to market their alfalfa-based hay. So uh, protein is not a part of this calculation. And generally, the higher your number was, the better. So if you had a number of 100, you know that you had a good um, quality hay. Now, if you had a number of 150, you knew that you had excellent hay. So, um, however, the challenge is that this number was okay to compare um, a grass to a grass or even an alfalfa to an alfalfa. However, um, you could not compare an alfalfa species to a grass species uh, in terms of hay for, for your um, uh, market. And the reason for that is basically uh, the NDF has a much higher impact in the um, RFV equation that used to be used. And this is a problem because if we look at the early stages of the alfalfa and the grasses, when they're starting to grow and mature, you can see that the NDF of an alfalfa is fairly low. Whereas the grass is already at 41%, the alfalfa at the state, at same time and age only has 21%. So as the alfalfa matures, this number will go up, um, you know, in the 40s. But the grasses overall with maturation doesn't change much. So um, during the course of maturation, of course, the alfalfa is changing. And if you have the equation based on the NDF uh, or a very high value or impact in that equation, then that's going to throw off the comparison. So therefore the relative forage quality was uh, the new equation that's now used. The NDF um, no longer has a weight that's about three times as much as the ADF in the new equation. Uh, and it keeps in mind the digestibility of the forage and is more representable. For a corn silage, however, uh, the relative forage quality is not a viable indicated, indicator um, because it is affected by the concentration of starch, uh, which basically has a dilution effect. So therefore, uh, in terms of energy, uh, the TDN is more valuable than the relative forage quality. Now looking at some forage samples uh, here, um, of course, there's effects of things that affect the quality and the quantity. So maturation, if you're looking for a uh, quantity, you might want to let, you know, your forage be in the field a little bit longer to have more growth. However, you probably um, don't do the quality any, any good because if you're looking for high protein or, for example, for alfalfa, you, um, you have more in terms of uh, volume, but the quality might be less. So after you cut it, the length of curing time may also affect the nutrient content. Uh, so, you know, a good time to dry it in is ideal, preferably less than uh, more. So slow drying, for example, to a cloudy day or no wind, um, you know, it takes more time for that moisture to reduce. And weather conditions during curing affects the uh, leaching. Um, so leaching is the loss of water soluble nutrients. And um, handling is another way that uh, nutrients are affected. So if you're uh, handling it really rough, for example, um, alfalfa, you may lose um, leaf, uh, which is called leaf shattering. And that could be up to 35% of your leaves are lost and that is uh, you know a big part of your nutritional sources for the animal. The plant also continues the uh, enzymatic activity until the um, dry matter is about 60%. So 
um, the plant enzymes still work, even though the plant is cut. And respiration losses of the soluble carbohydrates, for example, uh, can still happen after cutting. So um, I guess with this presentation, I hope that uh, you understand that providing nutritional requirements to the animal is important. And so it's, an, it's important to understand what your forage uh, provides to your animal in terms of nutrients. Um, you know, but it also helps you decide on what stage of life the animal, you know, is best to utilize this feed. Is it something that you're going to um, feed to your heifers as opposed to your milking animals? Or maybe it, uh, it's too rich and that's, you know, going to uh, be better for your dry cows rather than your lactating animals. Um, you can also use it to calculate your inventory. If you find that you need to use a lot because of the analysis uh, came back as, then maybe um, you want to calculate ahead and see if you have enough forages in, in storage uh, for you know, the winter months or until your next cut. And then sometimes uh, we use the analysis to uh, estimate a price in case of selling forage. Um, Often when you're the buyer, you really don't have, you know, much say in it, whether you um, wanted a certain uh, quality, but definitely as a seller, I think that uh, it would help you to give you a fair, um, fair suggestion on what you should sell it for if it comes back uh, and the analysis is really good. So with that, um, I also left a link at the bottom of that screen. Uh, if you're looking for more information on either what my presentation was about or on Forges itself, uh, you can go to that site and there will be uh, lots of information there for you, um, as well as uh, the team at OMAFRA is more than willing to help you if you need more information. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, so we do have time for a few questions. So I'll ask everyone, um, if you've got questions for Anita, please put them in either the Q&A or the chat and I will field them for you. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Anita. The first question I wanna ask is something that I, I just like asking nutritionists and other feed type people because I'm always curious. So when you get a, when you, Anita, get a feed analysis, what's the first thing you look at? I guess it depends if, you know, generally the soluble protein, because it's most available to the animal, um, you know, you, even though the soluble protein, I guess, is, is a good indication, uh, at the same time, you want the crude protein to be a good, um, you know, good number too, right? I mean, producers get excited when they have a number that's like in the 20s. Um, you know, and maybe not so much when it's uh, lower in the 17 or 18s. And maybe there was, you know, other factors that contributed to that. Um, you know, for example, weather. Sometimes these forages are ready to be taken off and there's a big rain that comes and, you know, it hangs around for long enough uh, for things to uh, mature over, the, over that time for it to dry enough um, to get back on the field. So, yeah, probably, uh, probably that's one of, kind of my go-to, um, yeah. Yeah, cool, thank you so much. That, that gives us a little bit of insight into how, how you're approaching the analysis. Um, although yeah, obviously could, all, all of those numbers are on there for a reason. Yeah, um, like it could be different on, on what you're feeding to, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And what the forage is. Yeah, okay, so um, at the beginning of your talk, you were talking about taking representative samples and you showed us a couple of pictures of some forage probes. Um, is there a style of probe that that you that you prefer or that uh, you've heard feedback on? No, um, although I would say for um, like bunks, if they are packed well, uh, those very uh, thin ones sometimes don't want to go into uh, the uh, bunks too well. Like you have ones that are about an inch uh, round, I guess, or in diameter. Uh, they work fairly well, but I think the most important part is make sure that they're sharp. And uh, it's amazing how fast they become dull when you take a few samples. You mm -hmm. think, you know, how much can a forage make my end of the probe dull? Well, it really can. 
um, you know, and, yeah. and the hard part is finding a place to sharpen them, to be honest, uh, because well, you don't want them sharpened unevenly either, because that will really affect you trying to get through the sample. And I will add just some of my own thoughts on that. You, you, if you have a serrated tip, it can be really hard to find a place to sharpen it. Sometimes it's just easier to replace them. But if yeah. you have a smooth tip or a scallop tip, those can be sharpened by hand. Be very careful. Yes. Um, but you can use a file and, and sharpen them. So I have, I have sharpened some of my own that are straight tipped yeah. that way. But like safety first, people, th those things should be sharp. Yes. Um, yeah. You just want to make sure that it's sharpened evenly, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like you absolutely. don't want to cut a piece out by accident. It will be like a hangnail. <laughs> um, when taking a fresh haylage sample, so coming off the field, hasn't fermented yet, um, at what point is the sample the most accurate, assuming your harvest will take a full day? Should it be the first wagon off, the last wagon off? Um, wh when, when should you be taking that sample? Um, I think you know, if, if you don't have spots in your field that are definitely affected by either flooding or, you know, you, you can tell that the stand was no good because it was really dry on top of the hill. Um, I would, I would say, you know, uh, if your loads are coming off of a field uh, where you can see that there's a large portion about fairly equally, you know, growth and maturation, um, I would just wait for those loads to come off and take a sam sample or two from each of those loads. Like I wouldn't worry about taking it a sample all day long uh, because in the meantime, you know, you're, you want to make sure that your sample is enclosed in a bag. It's not losing moisture, et cetera. But uh, really if you're taking a sample from areas that, you know, represented your field well, by just looking at the field, um, then yeah, just take it from a couple different loads and go from that. But ultimately, it, you know, most of it will be fed when you're, uh, when it's fermented. Um, so maybe that's the, still the best representation. Although the beginning of a bunk often is not a very good uh, representation for the first little bit because it's not packed nearly as well, or it should, well, it should be packed better, you know, the further you go into your bunk, let's say that. Um, so take it, a little bit into the bunk is probably better than right at the front. But if you have nothing to go by, then, you know, by all means, take a sample and then do it again uh, when you get a little further in. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question in here on ranges for a couple of those uh, parameters that you talked about. They don't specify what type of livestock they're feeding. So that may color your answer a little bit, but, um, this person usually looks for ADF less than 30% and ANDFOM as less than 40% is what they're targeting in their forage. Do you agree? What thoughts do you have on that? Hmm. Yes, that, that is really species <laughs> dependent. Um, I, I don't disagree because I mean, you still want that forage to uh, be digestible enough, right? Um, so those numbers are, um, yeah, probably a, a good um, measurement to go by. But again, it does depend on what else you're feeding as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's hard to uh, make those generalizations without an idea of what it's being fed to. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's sheep. I got an answer back. It's oh, sheep. okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what nutrient numbers would indicate heat damaged forage? Um, oh, can I still go back to my presentation? I guess not. <laughs> um, so you meaning, meaning the ADF CP and the NDF CP? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. You... Which, which parameters are you looking at and, and kind of what numbers would indicate there might be a problem with heating? Yeah. You'd like to have, uh, you know, no more than one to two percent of your, uh, based on a dry matter basis okay. of your analysis. Yeah. Um, so this, this is kind of where, this next question is kind of where the agronomy and the nutrition start, start to blur. So we might tag team this depending on, on your thoughts, but uh, we are in some parts of Ontario seeing a 
yield increase, particularly with alfalfa, by adding sulfur to the fertilizer blend. Um, could you comment a bit on sulfur in the forage analysis? Mm, no, I <laughs> no, I not just based on adding sulfur. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it it's a tough one because like we do have a threshold from the agronomy perspective of if if sulfur is less than I think it's 0.2 or 0.22 percent um, that indicates the plant is sulfur deficient. So we would expect to see a, a response to sulfur fertilizer, and we know that sulfur is important for um, making up some of the proteins and amino acids that livestock need. So it is an important nutrient, but um, it's a little hard to, to answer a question that general. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And, and I don't deal with, you know, the min mineral, uh, you know, I guess, I guess I don't focus as much on the mineral, uh, you know, because there's, uh, in diet, there's minerals added as well. Like, you know, so the o it's the overall picture that in the end, um, you know, is being fed to the animal, right? Now, of course, you know, there's three different diets, I guess. You know, there's one on paper, there's one that you make, and then there's one that you feed um, or the animal eats. So, I mean, that makes a difference too. But from my perspective uh, of my job, I guess, I don't focus in on the minerals much. Okay, right, thanks. Um, does the time of day when we cut forage affect quality and why? Uh, yes. Um, so the longer it's been in sunlight, the more photosynthesis it's been able to do. And so the sugars are often higher um, in later in the day. So if you're cutting later in the day, generally your, um, you know, your sugars are higher in your feed analysis. Um, and you know the the enzymes and all that are still working as well. But um, I guess if if you can cut it later in the day, you'll probably have uh, more sugars and um, it, but I get it, yeah, it's kind of hard because people promote you know quote unquote the hay in a day, um, but then if you're cutting at the end of the day, it's not going to work, you know. It, yeah, so much it's so a challenge in our climate with the humidity. So particularly on dry yeah. hay, like to to cut to try to make dry hay in the afternoon. Yes, yeah, it's too humid. It, you're probably gonna get it, it's gonna take too long to dry. So that's right. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, I mean, yeah, after hours of sun, you're definitely gonna have more sugars in there, which are beneficial. Um, not like for the fermentation, especially. You know, the the bugs in that while you're fermenting it, really thrive on the sugar um, to continue to keep their fermentation going. So that's where you're going to see the benefit. Okay. Um, is there any testing that could be done in the field by the farmer to determine some forage quality parameters, some, of, some indication of what the quality is in the field? Um, not necessarily test. I would literally uh, probably just uh, you know, go there often enough to see what stage of maturity your forage is. So for uh, haylitch, for example, that is, are the buds coming in, right? So uh, if you see a few flowers, that's probably a good time to start cutting. Your protein is high, your NDF and ADF are still at a, at a point where it's not affecting uh, the digestibility and the dry matter intake. And then for grasses, uh, it's probably, you know, how far is it, uh, is it in boot stage? Is it in head? Um, you know, try to catch it at the appropriate time so that your, uh, your protein is there and your energy, but also your NDF and ADF are not affecting the digestibility. All right. Um, how long should producers wait after harvest before sampling corn silage? And how often should they be resampling that? corn silage as they feed it out? Mm -hmm. um, well, any fermentation, you probably want to wait six to eight weeks um, before it's, you know, at a point where it, it probably won't ferment uh, that much more that the analysis is going to change just based on the uh, fermentation. Ferment, fermentation. Um, resampling, uh, I think if it's from the same field, um, 
you know, it's, it's hard to say how much it changes, right? If you see a lot of variability in your field, I would probably uh, do it a little bit more often, but also usually the animals give you a good indication whether that, uh, whether the dry matter is changing, for example, right? Uh, you're feeding the same amount, but they're eating at all or they're leaving some. Uh, so, you know, your, your feed stuff is either wetter or drier than you thought it was. Uh, and 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 thought, you know, and that's what you based your ration on. So um, I don't know. I, I think nutritionists, you know, like the sample more often than less if they can uh, to provide a accurate diet for the uh, producer. But in all honesty, uh, corn silage doesn't get sampled nearly as often, I think, on farm as a uh, haylage sample or grass silage. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have an interest in your thoughts on the usefulness of NDFD 240. So that 10 day, 10 day. run of, a, yes. of 10 day NDFD, yeah. You know, um, I haven't looked at a whole lot of information to be honest. Um, uh, I know the laboratories are, are doing it, um, you know, looking at it from a 10 day point of view, in terms of animals, I mean, by day 10, it's long gone. <laughs> we hope, we really hope. We yes. really hope, otherwise the uh, passage rate is quite slow. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, generally for, you know, the 24 and the 48 hour gives you a good indication. If anything, uh, you know, the 48 hour probably more so, you really wanna see that number increase after the 24 hours and, and not just be stagnant. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I can't comment much on that. And I guess I, I will add for the producers that are, are watching this, whenever you're looking at those NDFD numbers, do your best to, to match the amount of time. So if it's tw NDFD 24 and you're comparing to something else, NDFD 24 on both or 36 or 48, yeah. because yeah. they're running that same test for different lengths of time. And if you're comparing two different lengths of time, the numbers are going to be very different and, and you're not looking at the same um yeah the same answer essentially True. yep you're not comparing um, apples apples yeah exactly so so just keeping an eye on on the time on that ndfd test if you're trying to compare two two uh different analyses um anita do you know if there have been any comparisons of nir equ on equipment versus the lab test to show if this is an effective way of monitoring. I think they mean on farm, because I think there are some, mm, some handheld NIR units out there. Um, so have you, have you seen any uh, comparisons on the handheld versus the lab ones? I have seen it in terms of the companies who are promoting it. Um, I have seen a few used. Um, uh, in the early stages, you know, I, uh, I've seen them being used uh, with, some accuracy at some places and better than others. Uh, but I think overall that technology has improved over the last few years. Um, I haven't used it myself in, in the last few years, but um, you know, I, I think it's uh, beneficial if uh, you know, you're feeding out and you're getting um, a direct um, result that can change your um, feeding. Right. So in terms of, is it really changing much day over day? Maybe not so much, but if you're doing it week by week uh, and using it just to alter your ration a little bit, I think it's valuable. Um, but for, yeah, but f yeah, it's hard to say, you know, it, it's a little bit on personal opinion, I think, um, but they definitely have their place. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on making sure that you're feeding what you should be feeding. And if you want to change your uh, feed ingredients that often, right? Like a um, self-propelled feed mixer, for example, you, you know, you might be willing to change the diets in the system uh, more often than if you're using a um, tractor and TMR mixer, for example, uh, who, but that doesn't have that technology. Um when balancing a ration for dairy cows, what is the best NDFD to use? 12 
hour, 30 hour, 120 hour. Any thoughts on that? I am not sure, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone else has input on that. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard because we've set this up as a webinar rather than as a meeting. So they're they're limited in like they can oh, okay. send us stuff in the chat, but there's unfortunately less room for discussion amongst attendees in the chat, which uh, is not ideal. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if anyone if anyone has thoughts on which is the best length of time for NDFD to use, uh, how about tweet it out? Use the hashtag Forge Focus. Give us your thoughts on on the hour there. Okay, we've got time for one last question. So uh, one of our attendees says they have two samples of first cut baleage. One has 22% crude protein, but is only 47% soluble protein. The other is 19% crude protein, so lower crude protein, uh, but it's 67% soluble protein. So higher soluble, but lower crude. So does that make the second lot of baleage better better is fast, um, but better <laughs> yes. yes from a point of uh digestibility and available to the animals yes okay so there's always the caveat it does depend what you're feeding it does and depend going... what else you're feeding with it yes <laughs> yeah no well i mean it, it matters what what class of livestock you're feeding it matters what else you're feeding at the same time so i right. would suggest for that specific example please please go talk to your nutritionist uh because we're not able to help you balance a ration on this webinar but it's it's a fantastic question and uh you're right that those those differences in the numbers will affect how that feeds out all right, so it is one o'clock. Um, thank you so much, Anita, for, for your talk and answering some of our questions. And I would like to pass things back to uh, Forge Council's chair, Terry Noon, so that he can give us some closing remarks. Great, thank you, Anita. That was an excellent presentation and sharing your expertise with us all today. Sponsors for the support of these webinars. Thank you to Christine O'Reilly and Patricia Ellingwood for putting the program together. We will be back here tomorrow at 12 o'clock for our third and final presentation of this week. And I invite everyone to join us uh, tomorrow for our next speaker. Thank you and have a great day.